Let's imagine a Lithuanian waking up in the 1880s. Let's call him Matis. Matis wakes up in his small village aching from the previous day's hard labour and walks into town. On his way in, he notices that a small crowd has gathered, surrounding a strange new arrival. The stranger, speaking a foreign language, is being roughly translated by one of the locals. The stranger speaks of a unique opportunity for strong Lithuanian men and women willing to come to work in Scotland. Matis is intrigued. For the last few years, the wages he has been able to earn as a farmer have gone down. And ever since the failure of his country's uprising against the Russians 20 years ago, he and his people have suffered, facing persecution and religious discrimination. It is not entirely clear what sort of work is being offered over in Scotland. There is, after all, a language barrier between the Lithuanians and their Scottish guest. Mattis and his compatriots are agricultural workers, and, naturally, if there is work available in Scotland, they believe that it is in farming. In the end, the promise of greater wages and the possibility of escaping Russian persecution is too great to resist for Mattis and many of his friends. As they board the ship that will take them hundreds of miles away from their homeland, none of them could have imagined what lay for them on the other side of Europe. When we think about immigration into Scotland in the 19th century, we tend to think about those countries whose impact we can still see today. If you were to walk through the city centre of Glasgow or Edinburgh, for example, you would likely see the impact that two groups, the Irish and the Italians, have had on modern day Scotland, whether you see an Irish pub or an Italian restaurant or ice cream shop. What you probably won't see, however, is the long term impact of another important immigrant group, that of the Lithuanians. In 1914, there were roughly 8,000 Lithuanians living in Scotland. And yet, if you were to walk through a modern city in Scotland today, there would be remarkably few traces of this once vibrant community. And this raises something of a mystery. Firstly, why did a group of people coming hundreds of miles away from a small Eastern European country come to settle in Scotland? And secondly, why is there almost no trace of them almost a hundred years later? Situated in Eastern Europe, with the Baltic Sea to its west, and Latvia and Belarus to the east, the ancient country of Lithuania had long fought for its independence. Although a powerful Lithuanian Empire had dominated Eastern Europe from the 14th to the 16th centuries, by the 1800s she had fallen under the control of the much larger Russian Empire. Her latest attempt to gain independence in the Polish-Lithuanian uprising of 1863 had ended in crushing defeat and bitter disappointment for her people. The consequences of that defeat were severe. Unsurprisingly, Russia was not particularly happy with the Polish and Lithuanians following the uprising. To prevent such an event recurring, Russia imposed a policy of Russification on the peoples of Eastern Europe. Russification was Russia's attempt to impose its cultural and political identity into countries in Eastern Europe, to guarantee their loyalty. Not only was the Lithuanian language banned and areas of the country given away to ethnic Russians, but the Lithuanian Catholic faith was replaced by Russian Orthodoxy, and many Lithuanians were forcibly conscripted to fight in the Russian army. In these circumstances, Coupled with the fact that Lithuania was a very poor country at this time, thousands chose to leave. Shockingly, one in four, roughly 650,000 people fled the country between 1870 and 1914. The majority went to the United States, but, crucially, a small number, perhaps as many as 8,000, came to settle in Scotland. While the policy of Russification was one of the main factors pushing Lithuanians out of their country at this time, there were also factors pulling them towards Scotland. Recruitment agents, coming from Scotland to Lithuania, were looking to recruit young Lithuanians to come and work in the coal, iron and steel industries. Scotland in the 19th century was in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, which meant that there was an ever greater demand for workers. With greater demand and shorter supply came bigger wages, and this was one of the main factors pulling Lithuanians to come to Scotland. So what was life like for Lithuanians when they came to live in Scotland? Where did they live? What sort of jobs did they do? And how were they treated by the local inhabitants? 
Between 1880 and 1914, roughly 8,000 Lithuanians came to live in Scotland. In 1914, the census showed that the great majority of Lithuanians lived in Lanarkshire and Glasgow, with some others spread out throughout the central belt. Why do you think people would have lived in such specific areas? The reason Lithuanians settled in these areas is quite simple. This was where the major coal mines were based in Scotland, and it was coal mining rather than agriculture in which Lithuanians were put to work. As mentioned in Mattis's story, there is evidence that some Lithuanians, because of the language barriers at the time, had believed they were being employed as agricultural workers rather than coal miners, and it must have been some shock then when they discovered what jobs they were being asked to perform. After all, life as a coal miner in the late 19th century would have been incredibly tough. In the 1930s, the English author George Orwell gave a vivid description of what life could be like down in the mines. In Orwell's view, a mine was like hell, or at any rate, like my own mental picture of hell. Most of the things one imagines in hell are there. Heat, noise, confusion, darkness, foul air, and above all, unbearably cramped space. The job itself was dreadful, requiring an almost superhuman effort by the standard of an ordinary person. A typical workday required a seven and a half hour shift, but before this back-breaking shift had even begun, a miner had to get to the coal underground. And this required descending roughly 400 yards below the Earth's surface, and once below, a miner had to walk, well, practically crawl actually, as the mines were often only four foot high, up to five miles underground, just to arrive at the coal seam. And this commute, comparable, Orwell says, to climbing a smallish mountain before and after your day's work, was unpaid. Orwell had gone down a mine in the 1930s when conditions in the mines had actually improved. So when you think about what Mattis and his fellow Lithuanians had to contend with in the 1880s, you should get some picture of how difficult life would have been for them. Given the need for labour and the challenging nature of the work itself, we might expect the local Scots to have accepted these Lithuanian workers with open arms. Well, no, actually. Life for the Scots wasn't that much easier. Despite the brutal reality of working in the mines, these jobs were nonetheless highly sought after, and some Scots did not take kindly to people from Lithuania coming hundreds of miles away from the other side of Europe coming to take these positions. On top of this, there is evidence that some Lithuanians were used as strike breakers, and in these circumstances, some Scots felt resentful of their Lithuanian neighbours. In 1887, Keir Hardy, a leader of the Ayrshire Miners' Union, declared that the Lithuanian presence was a menace to the health and morality of the place, and is, besides, being used to reduce the already too low wages earned by the workmen. Another, writing in a newspaper in 1900, described Lithuanians as most filthy in their habits of life, being a source of danger to the health of the community, a most barbarous people. Fortunately for the Lithuanians, these impressions did not last. Like the experience of other immigrants in Scotland, such as the Irish, over time Lithuanians became more welcome and assimilated into Scottish society. Many workers soon joined the trade unions that helped Scots fight for better working conditions. In the end, Lithuanians were more rapidly absorbed into the local community than some other immigrant groups. Despite their Catholicism, Lithuanian children tended to attend local Scottish schools, and this helped them assimilate into Scottish society. So what happened to the 8,000 or so Lithuanians that had come to live in Scotland by 1914? Why are we unlikely to see any traces of this community in modern day Scotland? The virtual disappearance of the Lithuanian heritage in Scotland can be explained by two basic points. Firstly, many Lithuanians simply left Scotland. The first large departure of Lithuanians came as a result of the First World War. In the summer of 1917, the British and Russian governments were busy fighting against Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy, and they needed as many men as possible to fight, particularly in Eastern Europe. It was agreed, therefore, to force Lithuanians of fighting age to either join the British army or return to join the Russian army. 
While the British government initially provided financial support for the families of the soldiers who agreed to fight, this support was ended in 1920, effectively forcing thousands of Lithuanians with little realistic choice but to return home. The second reason the Lithuanians seemed to effectively disappear from Scottish society was that those that stayed tended to assimilate into Scotland. Unlike the large Irish Catholic and Jewish communities who were often educated in separate schools and retained something of their own separate identity, Lithuanians tended to take steps to hide their heritage. From replacing their Lithuanian names with British sounding names, attending local schools and gradually integrating themselves into the Scottish community, over the generations Lithuanians tended to lose touch with their own culture and heritage. Thomas Devine has claimed that many Lithuanians were adapting to life in Scotland by becoming invisible. So, the story of Lithuanian immigration beginning in the 1880s and reaching a high point in 1914 began with the effort of Scottish recruiters coming to Lithuania. Once there, they were able to attract thousands of Lithuanians to come to Scotland and work in the coal mines in the central belt of Scotland. Despite facing some initial discrimination, many were able to assimilate themselves into Scottish society. Those that didn't tended to return back to Lithuania. In the period during and shortly after the First World War, many Lithuanians returned back to Eastern Europe to fight in the Russian army. And this explains why there are so few traces of this once vibrant community in modern day Scotland. Thanks for watching this video, hopefully you enjoyed it. Please leave any feedback in the comments below. And finally, if you are looking for a history tutor, please just drop me an email. Thanks and see you next time.